بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا وإمامنا وحبيبنا أبي القاسم محمد بن عبد الله وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I praise Allah Almighty and I send prayers and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his noble family, righteous companions and all those that follow them with the right guidance until the day of judgment. Ameen. Glory be to you, O Allah. No knowledge have we except that which you have taught us. Indeed, you, all, you are the all-knowing, the all-wise. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We continue with the tafsir of Surah Al-Baqarah. We got to the following ayah. بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ وَإِذْ وَاعَدْنَا مُوسَى أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ ثم عفونا عنكم من بعد ذلك لعلكم تشكرون وإذ آتينا موسى الكتاب والفرقان لعلكم تهتدون After the verse that we spoke about last time where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the severe persecution of Bani Israel by Fir'aun and his followers, the slaughtering of the children, pure infanticide, and leaving the girls alive to witness and, and live with that disgrace for the rest of their lives. Before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them through Prophet Musa alayhi salam when he took them out. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had inspired to Musa alayhi salam to take them out at night. This itself was a blessing. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala got them out and away from Fir'aun and his followers. But of course, the ordeal is not finished yet. Because Fir'aun is not going to sit back and watch. Okay, He's going to go after them. And this is why, and this is where we come to the saying of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ Ultimately, these verses are mentioning what happened here in general. Okay? We said this is a Madani surah. And it was revealed in the beginning of the Madani era. And... A lot of these details were already mentioned, okay? As we saw in other surahs, in Mecca surahs, in detail about what happened exactly when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them. But here it's just this one liner. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ But it's a reminder, it's a constant reminder, and that's what the Quran is. So it's reminding them about this blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved you from the claws of that tyrant and from all the crimes that they were perpetrating against you. And now there is this awesome miracle, one of the greatest miracles the world has ever seen. When you ran away with Musa alayhi salam, but all of a sudden, there seemed to be no way out. Because all there was in front of you was al-bahr, the sea. 
and Fir'aun and his people are behind you. It wouldn't be surprising if Fir'aun had a lot of soldiers with him. And different narrations mention different things. The authenticity of which we cannot be absolutely sure. But some narrations mention that Musa السلام, had hundreds of thousands. And that Fir'aun had more. Imagine. Because Fir'aun, when he was talking about Bani Israel, he called them Shirdhimatun Qalilun. Shirdhima, a small band of uh, vagabonds, pariahs, call them what you will, right? Shirdhima uh, Qalilun. Nothing compared to Fir'aun and his soldiers and uh, his entourage and every, all his followers. So it could be that they were very, very many. And now Musa السلام, sees nothing but the sea in front of him. Uh, we won't go into all uh, the details as mentioned in some of the other ayahs, but let us talk a little bit about it just to grasp uh, and picture, put everything into perspective here. What is going on? The people of uh, the followers of Musa alayhi salam, subhanallah, of little faith, tell Musa alayhi salam, inna lamudrakun. That's it, we're goners. What, what can we do now? And to be frank and, and fair, in the if you, if you look at it in terms of the worldly means, okay, and in terms of a, a worldly view or perspective, it seems like there's no way out, okay? <laughs> we're done for. But here we're talking about a different domain. This is the domain of the miracles, the domain of the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you're talking about the domain of the supernatural here. Okay, and it is with that faith and tawakkul that Musa alayhi salam tells them, "Kalla, no, inna ma'ya Rabbi sayhdin. My Lord is with me; He will give me a way; He will guide me. Even though you look at it and you say, how? But when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa taala, brothers and sisters, you don't say how." <laughs> He does what he pleases. He says, "Kun fayakun." Wa id farqna bikum al bahar. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, as we know, parted the sea for them. Notice here, he said, "Wa id farqna bikum al bahar." And translations may possibly say, "We have parted the sea for you." But here, this is bikum. And Bikum means Bikum, Arabs, Arabs, Arab, Arab speakers who are not, yeah, with you. Bikum. Almost like it's through you, right? So for you would be Lakum. Faraqna Lakum. But it's not Lakum, it's Bikum. Faraqna Bikum al Bahar. It's almost as if we used you. To separate the uh, sea. You were the means. You were the means to part the sea. Allahu Akbar. Parting the sea. It's, uh, this is no simple matter. And this is a great blessing that they were given. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have saved them in any other way. But no, it was through this great ayah where he parted the sea with them or for them. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ And we saved you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon that told Musa alayhi salam to uh, strike the, that body of water with his stick, with his staff. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala parted it for him. 
So now I ask you, brothers and sisters, what kind of a staff was this? Was it a, a magical staff? Was it a wand? Like a magician's wand? Was it? <laughs> it was just a regular stick. It was a, the stick that Musa alayhi salam had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does what he wills. Allah made it such. Allah said, commanded the ocean to part and it did. But again, notice, he tells him, strike it. For what? Did you try striking the, the ocean? Take a stick and strike it. Strike it a million times. You know what's going to happen? Nothing. You're just going to get some water splashing on you. <laughs> right? He doesn't have to. Maryam السلام, didn't have to shake the palm tree. None of this is required. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches human beings, you do your part. You take the means. This in no way contradicts tawakkul. Am I somehow cancelling the effect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when I take those means? By the way, it's the exact opposite. If you do not take the proper means thinking you are doing tawakkul, you're doing the exact opposite. You know why? Because it seems that you have a, 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 the idea that the means that you are putting forth will necessarily bring about that conclusion. And without Allah commanding, that conclusion will not be brought about. So you take the means, but ultimately it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who decrees. So there's no contradiction. But we take the means as Allah taught us. And he tells Musa alayhi salam, strike it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala parted it for him. What sea is this? What body of water is it? Is it a small body of water? Yes? We know for a fact that it can't be. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that when it parted, each side was like a huge mountain. So this is not a small body of water. Before we even claim to know what it is, we know that this is a big body of water, a sea or an ocean. Popularly, it is the Red Sea. It is usually thought of as the Red Sea, right? And this seems to be... Uh, based on the biblical narration. By the way, in these verses that we are discussing, there is remarkable similarity between the Qur'an and the present Bible, which tells us that the Bible in this aspect is correct and has not been corrupted beyond rectification. Okay? As long as it... Uh, agrees with the Qur'an, then in this it is correct. But it mentions uh, the yam, okay, as the word is in Hebrew, and it is interpreted as the Red Sea. Later on, scholars started reinterpreting and looking at the translation and said actually it is more accurately translated and interpreted as the Sea of Reeds not the Red Sea Reeds being some kind of uh, vegetation inside the sea and then subhanallah you have uh, different opinions 
about where exactly this crossing happened and where this great parting of the sea happened. And you, had, you have archaeological studies and research going on. And on this as well, it seems, subhanAllah, that the jury is still out. But it might not be the Red Sea. It actually might be somewhere more north of that. Possibly even north of the... Because you have, if you imagine the, the geography, I know we have some Egyptians here, and maybe non-Egyptians as well who know their geography. So you have Egypt, right? And then you have the Sinai, and then you have a body of water in between. When you go a little bit downwards, that's where you have the Red Sea. But then what you have north of that is the Suez Canal. And north of that you have the Nile Delta. Okay, And you have a bunch of different estuaries and uh, uh, bodies of water there. Okay, So there are opinions and there is research that it may be somewhere there where the crossing happened and where the parting happened. But again, it has to uh, agree with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in the Qur'an. If this is a small body of water that cannot be parted such that each side is like a mountain, then this cannot be the place where it happened. Okay? And it's interesting because we are interested and we are also required to, to look and to study and to research. But the Qur'an did not tell us what this body of water was. Interestingly, uh, it comes up all the time in the Qur'an. Sometimes he calls it Al-Bahr. And sometimes he calls it Al-Yam. Right? So, research. Look into it. Where could it be? What is it? Does it agree with and conform with all of the verses that talk about what happened there? In this ayah, it is general. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرَ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقَنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ So now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala parted this body of water, this sea for, for Musa alayhi salam, and they start walking. Some narrations mention, indeed, that the parting was not just one way. It was not just uh, one track, but rather 12 tracks for each of the tribes of Bani Israel. Okay? And uh, some narrations even mention that, you know, Bani Israel gave Musa alayhi salam a hard time. This is just a fact. Okay? So even then, it wasn't enough that there were 12 tracks. We can't see our relatives, our friends. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even allowed them to peer through the waves to the other track to see them. Okay, there's a narration that mentions this as well. Allahu a'lam. It could be that it was the 12 tracks or that it was just one track through which uh, Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel got through. Of course, what we do know, as the Qur'an tells us, is that it was dry land. They did not swim across it, they walked across it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala parted it for them, such that they could just walk across. Okay? طَرِيقًا فِي الْأَرْضِ يَبَسًا Dry. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. How do you just... <laughs> uh, they got through. And after they, they walked through, Musa alayhi salam wanted to quickly close it again so that Fir'aun and his people will not catch up with them. And we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that Allah commanded him to wait and leave it until Fir'aun and his followers are in the middle of the sea and then he would close it upon them and they would drown. And there are also, there's also speculation about how those mountains of, of water 
came back and eventually uh, drowned Fir'aun. And how exactly they were drowned. Because if you look in the Quran, most of the time when he mentions Al-Ighraq, drowning Fir'aun and his followers, he mentions Al-Yam. So this is something interesting to look into as well. Okay, and why that is and what we may conclude from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them through this uh, incredible miracle and drowned their enemies. So there is no way that anyone can say Fir'aun and his people survived or any one of them survived. وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ Which includes Fir'aun. Fir'aun and all of his followers drowned. It's finished. And every single Israeli was saved. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he saved them all. وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ Another blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed your enemy and you saw it. وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ You were able to witness it in order to, to put out that fire in your heart that you have because of the, your, your child that was killed or your brother or your relative. You saw it in front of you, subhanallah. Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have saved them in another way. And that would have been enough. But no, in this way and drowning them in front of you. Look at the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon them. And remember this when we get to the next ayah. Okay? The Prophet ﷺ said in the authentic hadith that if Allah Azza wa Jal wants to, uh, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is going to punish a people for what they did to their Prophet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish them while that Prophet watches. And this happened. As we know, to prophets like Hud and Salih, Ad and Thamud, when they were destroyed, okay? But this destruction usually happened before, right? After this destruction and Musa alayhi salam receiving the Torah, this type of general comprehensive destruction did not happen anymore. It was up to and the responsibility of the people to take care of their enemies. وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ Then he says, وَإِذْ وَاعَدَنَا مُوسَىٰ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً So now, this is in one qira'a, in another uh, authentic qira'a, وَإِذْ وَعَدْنَا What's the difference between wa'adna and wa'adna? Wa'adna, if we say wa'idh wa'adna, okay, which is not the qira'ah of uh, Hafs, wa'idh wa'adna, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised Musa this. It was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promising him what? Uh, this appointment with him, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would talk to Musa alayhi salam, Allah Azza wa Jal gave him this appointment which was altogether 40 days. In Surah Al-A'raf he tells us it was 30 plus 10. Okay? 40. In total it was 40. Here he mentions the 40. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised him this through no uh, action or interaction from the side of Musa alayhi salam. But when we say, وَإِذْ وَاعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ It's as if the, this appointment is from both sides. From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Musa and Musa alayhi salam promising to come to 
speak with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to receive his blessing. Which was, as we will see, the uh, Torah. وَإِذْ وَاعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً 40 days, uh, 40 nights, sorry. Why does he mention the nights rather than the days? Any ideas? Arba'ina layla. Well, for one thing, interestingly, as we know, this is a, a very blessed and sacred time. This is alone time between Musa alayhi salam and his Lord. Right? And usually the best time for that alone time between a slave servant and his Lord is at night. This is munaja, right? This, is, this should be at night. This is the best time. وَإِذْ وَعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً Forty nights. By the way, just going back quickly to the, uh, the story of the parting of the sea. When did that happen? What day did that happen? Do you know? Yes? Yes, brother? Barakallah Ashura? Sometimes we don't connect it. It was Ashura. Ashura is what? What is the definition of Ashura? Tenth of Muharram. So on the tenth of Muharram, this was the day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Musa and Bani Israel. And we know that from the authentic hadith. When the Prophet ﷺ saw that the Jews were fasting this day, that's how important it was to them. They were fasting on this day when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them. So the Prophet ﷺ said, We are more worthy of Musa السلام, than them. So that's why he commanded us to fast it as well. The 10th of Muharram was that day when that miracle happened, the parting of the sea. وَإِذْ وَاعَدْنَا مُوسَىٰ أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ Subhanak ya Rabb. We just finished telling the story really quickly, very briefly, how Allah Azza wa Jal gave them this remarkable miracle and saved them from this tyrant through this a miracle that is mentioned and researched until today. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is blessing them again because their Prophet Musa alayhi salam who just saved them is going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to receive further blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he is going for 40 days and nights and he is going to receive the Torah, the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Jews couldn't wait long enough. And they felt that he took too long. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us again, rather briefly, tells us, and it is more detailed in other ayahs, inshallah, may Allah give us life. To, to get to the tafsir of those ayahs, insha'Allah. But in brief, uh, Musa alayhi salam went to receive the Torah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he left whom to look after Bani Israel? His brother Harun. He gave them the responsibility of looking after them. What happened? The Jews could not wait and they felt that Musa alayhi salam went for too long. 40 days and nights, a month and 10 days, subhanAllah. After you were just saved from this tyrant who has been persecuting you for so long. So what did they do? They uh, started worshipping a golden calf of their own making. Can you believe it? Not any live animal. It's not even a live animal. Okay? It's a golden calf of their own making. 
they figured Musa alayhi salam went for too long. In the other ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that they accused Musa alayhi salam of forgetting his Lord. Whom? The golden calf. They claimed Musa alayhi salam forgot that this is his Lord. Why are they now worshipping a golden calf? Is the golden calf the one who saved them from Fir'aun? Or parted the sea for them? This is mentioned in the Bible as well. This story is mentioned in the Bible. And it is considered a great sin. But this is where the biblical narration departs from the Quranic narration. Because the Bible puts the blame on whom? On Harun. Subhanak, Ya Rabb. Harun made the calf, alayhi salam, and forced Bani Israel to, to worship it. Ta'ala Allah. No. This is where it went awry. And you can see why. Because this type of sin, this unspeakable sin, cannot be exonerated in any way, right? You cannot defend Bani Israel worshipping the golden calf immediately afterwards, just because Musa السلام, went for 40 days and nights to receive the Torah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no way to defend it. But if you say... Harun himself, right? Another prophet. He was the one who was looking after them. He had authority over them. He made the calf and he told them to worship it. Then we can kind of see that it's a little bit more acceptable, right? You can see how sometimes the corruption in the Bible or the uh, Old Testament... You can see how the corruption was done for uh, and for, for what purpose, okay? So you can see the types of verses that were changed and you can understand possibly the motivation behind it, right? So here, this is what's going on. So the blame was put on, on Harun, alayhi salam. The Quran exonerates him completely. It has nothing to do with Harun. This is their sin and their sin alone, along with a Samiri, right? The Jewish man who actually uh, made this golden calf for them. And they started worshipping it, right? Harun السلام, was doing everything he could to stop them, but he couldn't. And Musa السلام, told him, do not divide Bani Israel. Be careful. Look after them. Be careful of the wrongdoers and the corruptors. Amongst them there are Mufsideen, there are corruptors. Beware of them. Bani Israel almost killed Harun alayhi <laughs> salam. Almost killed him. After they were just saved. And after Musa is going to receive the Torah. This is the way the Quran defends Harun. And exonerates him of anything having to do with the calf worship. So they started worshipping a calf. What happened to pure monotheism? Put the blessing aside. Put your feeling of gratitude to, what, to how Allah just saved you aside. Where is pure monotheism? That they claim that they practice also. You're worshipping a golden calf. And of course the story continues. Uh, and Musa alayhi salam comes back and he cannot believe it. And he drops the, the tablets obviously. And he takes Harun by his beard and his... His head and he said, what did you do? And it's, it's, it's really something else. But here, the Quran is just giving us the, uh, 
the story in brief. وَإِذْ وَاعَدْنَا مُوسَى أَرْبَعِينَ لَيْلَةً ثُمَّ اتَّخَذْتُمُ الْعِجْلَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِ وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ No question about it. وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ You cannot defend it. Nothing can be said. وَأَنْتُمْ ظَالِمُونَ And you were wrongdoers. This was something that you did, that you brought about yourselves. So Allah forgave them. And as you will see, one ayah after another, Allah forgave. They reneged again, Allah forgave. Reneged, Allah forgave. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. After what? After all that you did? So therefore, Allah forgave. But there's going to be a price for this repentance. This is not any normal repentance as we will see inshallah next time. But now we put it into perspective. After the parting of the sea, first saving them from Fir'aun, leaving the, the, the place where Fir'aun was, parting the sea for them, drowning. He didn't have to drown them. Save them and leave Fir'aun alive. No, وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ You saw them drown. Allah drowned them in front of you. Then Musa السلام, now is going to receive a Torah. Okay? And then... You go and you worship a golden calf. Ultimate ingratitude. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave them. He didn't have to. He could have destroyed them. Just like he destroyed Fir'aun and his people. And if he had done that, he would not have done it unjustly. But he forgave them. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that maybe you will be grateful. And then he details it uh, after the ayah that we will discuss now. Then he said, وَإِذْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْفُرْقَانَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given Musa alayhi salam al-kitab. Al-kitab is al-tawra. Okay? Al-kitaba wal-furqan. We read in the Quran quite a bit, Al-Furqan. The Quran is known as a Furqan. Al-Kitab wal-Furqan. Is it different? Many scholars of tafsir said it is the same thing. وَإِذْ آتَيْنَ مُوسَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْفُرْقَانَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُوا Al-Kitab wal-Furqan. Meaning that these are two uh, characteristics, adjectives for the same thing which is Al-Tawrah. Al-Tawrah being... Uh, the book that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Musa alayhi salam Al-Kitab uh, wal-Furqan this is Al-Kitab is Al-Tawrah and then you have Al-Furqan and he describes it as Al-Furqan Al-Furqan being Al-Furqan bayna al-Haq wal-Batil Al-Furqan means the criterion between truth and falsehood and the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always a criterion because it separates between truth and falsehood. Some Mufassirin said it might be that Al-Kitab is Al-Tawrah itself, and then Al-Furqan is whatever legislation is mentioned in the Torah, and you know that the Torah is full of legislation, right? The Jews were making it difficult for themselves, and therefore the, the, the commandments in the Torah were also harsh, okay? That's why the, we know that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was described as lifting some of those difficulties when he came. But those difficulties were there, of course, it was with what their own hands have reaped. So, uh, Al-Furqan could be the legislation in the Quran, in the uh, Torah. But ultimately, it is a book that guides 
التوراة الكتابة والفرقان لعلكم تهتدون that maybe you will be guided and this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided uh, all of the peoples he would send a prophet or a messenger and he would send along with that prophet or messenger a book through which that they can, they can be guided yes it might be sufficient to have a prophet or a messenger and to follow and emulate that prophet and messenger but you can see the importance of a book that connects you with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A book that you can read. A book, that, a book that you can ponder over and understand. And see the beauty of the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bonafide, genuine from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before they started corrupting it with their own hands. As happened later on with the Bible. So this is another blessing. Another blessing upon you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you this in order that you may be guided. So, Musa alayhi salam was coming back to them with a gift. The words of Allah, the book of Allah. And he finds them worshipping a golden calf. Can you imagine the, the heartache <laughs> that Musa feels السلام, at that point? They gave him such a hard time. And Harun as well. He couldn't even defend himself when his brother came back. And we will continue insha'Allah next time. Wallahu a'lam. وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وجزاكم الله خيرا